All right, welcome everyone. You are joining us for the fifth session of the Colorado Restaurant and Bar Show virtual education series. You've joined us for to tip pool or not to tip pool, what you need to know about changing your wage model. We're gonna give it just a moment here and then we will get going. Let a few of our attendees in, okay. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Molly Steineman with the CRA. Molly, take it from here. Awesome, thank you, Sally Ann. This is Molly Steineman. I'm the manager of local government affairs for the Colorado Restaurant Association. Thank you for joining us for the fifth session of our 2020 Colorado Restaurant and Bar Show virtual education series. We, we created this series because we know that the COVID-19 pandemic is the most challenging crisis the restaurant industry has ever encountered. And that many of you are wondering after a crushing shutdown and tenuous summer, how will we survive the winter? This series aims to help answer that question. In weekly sessions, we're featuring industry experts who dig into operational best practices to give practical, implementable ideas you can immediately apply to your own business. Joining us today is Todd Fredrickson, labor law attorney with Fisher & Phillips, who will outline the four main wage models used by restaurants and discuss the legal considerations of each. Aileen Riley, co-owner of Beast & Bottle in Coperta, will then discuss the model she is using at her restaurants and why she and her partners decided to make the change and how it's impacted their operations. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A function in the bottom menu of your Zoom window. We will be posting the recording of the discussion in about 24 hours in the CRB Show Education Series event app. Please let me add that over the course of the next several months, after a break over the holidays, this series will continue. We'll cover a number of topics, including additional revenue streams, social media, and more. Join us for one session, all sessions, or anything in between. Sign up for the series on Event Cadence and stay tuned for more details. And without further ado, I will turn it over to Todd. Thanks, Molly, and thanks, Sally Ann, for uh, organizing this event. And good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we're going to talk about um, the, <laughs> it's either your favorite topic or your least favorite uh, topic, uh, tip pools today, uh, largely because they continue to be sort of front and center in the litigation that we're seeing in my office. And so we thought it made good sense to revisit the issue and then talk about some of the models that we're seeing. Uh, we'll talk about uh, four of them, but uh, certainly there are variations with each of these models that a number of you are using. We're hoping that uh, through the chat function or the Q&A part of this process, we can talk about other creative ideas uh, that you all are using and, and perhaps comment on, on whether um, you can get the legal uh, uh, thumbs up or thumbs down uh, on, on what you're doing. Um, by the way, that reminds me that um, whenever we talk about these issues, since the threat of litigation is so real, you know, what we want to do is play Las Vegas, right? What we talk about on this call should stay on this call, um, largely for the sake of the industry. So uh, let's jump in. Before I talk about the models, um, I wanted to just go back and remind you uh, as I often do of what the rules are and uh, just, just to make sure that we're all um, really starting from the same page, literally and figuratively. Know that, um, you know, we have to pay attention to federal, state, and local law, especially for those of you that are in Denver, because we're going to be talking about the full minimum wage, and those of you in Denver are subject to a much higher minimum wage than is required by the state, and certainly is required by the feds. I think federal minimum wage is still in the uh, $7 range or $8 range. The sort of threshold decision you all have to make when we're talking about tip pools or service charges or some uh, combination of the tool uh, of the two is, you know, are you going to take the tip credit? Or are you going to pay the full minimum wage? Because depending on your answer to that question, um, you may have more latitude in, uh, in what you can do uh, or less latitude, as the case might be. You want to make sure that uh, you're providing employees with uh, advance written notice if you're taking the tip credit as opposed to pay, uh, paying the full minimum wage. Otherwise, your posters on your five on, five on ones that are you know where your normal employee postings are uh, will suffice. You need to notify employees of the amount of tip credit claimed. Um, if you're posting the COPS order, that tells you what the amount of tip credit is that you can claim. And so that can be sufficient. Although, frankly, I like to see uh, tip memos that are uh, put out in front of employees that they sign off on. And uh, for those of you on, on the call that are interested in seeing a template, uh, send me an email. I'll be happy to share ours. 
Uh, and then of course, it's your job to make sure that if, if um, you are taking the tip credit, that the tipped uh, employee minimum wage plus tips uh, meets the applicable minimum wage. And for most of you, that's not gonna be an issue. I mean, one of the great uh, uh, issues of our time in the industry is the huge disparity between which servers make and what the rest of uh, um, your employees are, in some cases, even you make. Um, and, uh, and we know that you're trying to alleviate or reduce that disparity by shifting service charges and tips around. Um, but you gotta be careful in doing that. Uh, make sure that uh, your folks are getting, you know, the folks that are sharing in tips are getting at least $30 a month in tips. And remember, uh, it's very important that tips still remain the sole property of the employee and you're limited in what you can do with them. Uh, again, with, if, you're, if you're following a tip, mold, tool, a tip pool model, um, you want to make sure that that's part of your tip memo. And, uh, and the template that I have uh, accomplishes both what was required on the first slide and what's required on this slide. Uh, you're supposed to share tips only with employees who customarily and regularly receive tips. If you're taking the tip credit, uh, keep in mind that if you uh, make that threshold decision to pay the full minimum wage, then uh, you uh, may, able, may be able to share with, for example, back of the house staff. That's what the new food guy case uh, stands for, and that is uh, continues to be current law in Colorado. Um, I, I've, you know, I always remind people there's a yes group, a no group, and a maybe group. The yes group are, are the folks that the case law, the Depart Federal Department of Labor in its field operations handbook and in its regulations uh, say, uh, can share in a tip pool. So servers, you know, counter personnel who serve customers, uh, uh, sushi chefs, for example, so long as they're not managers, owners, or supervisors can share. Um, and then uh, uh, bussers and service bartenders. And bussers is always the odd one, right? Because the Department of Labor has said bussers can share. But the question I always ask is, what busser has regular customer interaction? Uh, in most cases, they have none. They're usually there to clean up after the, the guest has left, yet the Department of Labor has seen fit to allow them to participate in tip pools. And then service bartenders, so folks that are working the bar that are actually involved in regular interaction with the patron. Uh, the no group is obvious as the nose on my face, uh, thanks to the recent amendment of the Fair Labor Standards Act, no owners, managers, supervisors, and just for good measure, the Department of Labor has said no janitors. Uh, I say maybe dishwasher, dishwashers, chefs, cooks, and food prep. Those are your back of the house folks, and they can share if and only if you're paying full minimum wage. The closer cases are hosts, although I, I think hosts have become less of a close case over the years, thanks to the Outback Steakhouse case where hosts were permitted to share in tip pools. Barbacks can share in a tip pool, but you got to make sure they have regular guest interaction. I mean, minute by minute. Uh, quarter hour by quarter hour interaction with your guests if they're going to share in a tip pool. I put expediters in red for a couple of reasons. One, to remind me to stop and talk about them in particular, but also um, whenever you see stuff in red for me, it's usually, you know, danger, danger, danger. Um, uh, I've been talking for a while that I think this is an area of exposure for the industry. Um, the, the field operations handbook talks about server helpers. It used to be undefined. Now it says server helpers, e.g., for or for example, uh, bussers. Um, so that's just an example. Um, but uh, from my perspective, if you have expediters that uh, have regular guest interaction, as I've described it already, um, they're you know they're interacting with the guest. Um, your chances of allowing them to share properly in a tip pool go way up. I will tell you that uh, one of your peer restaurants uh, this week got a determination from the Colorado Department of Labor where they are taking that restaurant to task on using expo workers. Um, so the, the uh, moral of the story is you gotta make sure that your expo uh, food runners, expediters have that regular guest interaction. And I've been talking about it for the last three years at the, at the CRA conference. So that shouldn't be news to any of you who have participated in those. You've heard it from Iva Townsend from Big Red F too, who's been uh, 
uh, pretty vocal about, about you know, who can share and not share and tip rules and we presented together, I think two years ago. Um, uh, I've also listed employees who act like supervisors. So that's the, uh, the perceived supervisor problem. If you let uh, one of your employees run amok and act like a supervisor or a manager and they're sharing in the tip rule, when your employees go to a plaintiff's lawyer and the plaintiff's lawyer says, uh, did your employer allow uh, managers or supervisors supervisors to share in a tip pool, their answer is going to be yes. And then you're going to have to unwind that. And it's going to cost you a lot of money to pay somebody like me to help you unwind it. So better that you take care of it now and nip it in the bud. Uh, keep in mind that there's a you know, federal overlap with the new comps order that went into effect in March, uh, right after the first shutdown, uh, our Department of Labor saw fit to issue its new comps order. Um, you know, they're the gift that keeps on giving, aren't they? And uh, so keep in mind, you got to pay attention to federal law, but you also got to be paying attention to what's in that comp order because there are some, some differences there. But when it comes to tipping, the comp order reinforces what I've uh, essentially already told you. I um, already talked about some of these uh, issues. Again, starting point is that uh, Congress told us that or reminded us that owners, managers, and, and supervisors can't share in a tip pool. Uh, the new food, food guy case, uh, great decision, still good law, says if you pay full, full minimum wage, um, uh, you get to decide uh, how you share tips. Of course, keep in mind the first point above that, which is still no, no owners, managers, or supervisors. Um, remember that we have this amendment to the Colorado, Colorado Wage Claim Act in section 8-4-103, paragraph six, that placard that you all used to use has been replaced by a notation on the menu temp or receipt that you share uh, your tips among employees in your establishment. That's especially important if you're sharing with folks that don't customarily share in tips like back of the house stuff. Uh, so what's the safest approach for now? It's probably the more conservative one uh, to follow what I've talked about to a T. I know some of you on the call are shaking your head. You're thinking to yourselves, you know, I hear, I hear what he's saying, but we're still going to, you know, we're going to push the envelope. We're going to do a dual job. So, you know, our managers can pick up shifts as servers. And, uh, and when they're servers, we'll keep track of their time and we'll let them share in the tip pool. But when they're managers, we'll keep track of their time still and they won't share in a tip pool. Um, I think uh, you are asking for trouble uh, if you're doing that. And it's, I, I got two calls just this week on that very issue. And uh, I don't mean to be virtually pointing at you, by the way, I've just got myself doing that. Um, if you're doing that, um, you know, there's no basis in the law that says you can't do it. But more importantly, there's no basis in the law uh, that, uh, that says that you can. And that means that plaintiff's lawyers will take you to task uh, if you're doing that. The lawyers that represent employees are just looking for reasons to to send you demand letters and bring lawsuits. Um, so let's talk about the, the various uh, models. And then um, after I'm done with this, I did flag a few other wage and hour issues that I wanna to talk to you about because uh, they continue to plague the industry. And I just don't wanna uh, see a cut off guard, including one area where um, we have seen a significant uptick in lawsuits that are being filed. It involves rest periods. I'll get to it in a minute. So. Various models, uh, classic tipping, um, you know, if uh, uh, employees are getting direct tips and you just let them keep their tips, that's easy. Um, all employees get to keep direct tips, even managers and supervisors. So if they're not sharing in the tip pool, you don't have a problem. It's the minute you create a tip pool that you have to police it to make sure that owners, managers, and uh, supervisors are not uh, uh, sharing in a tip pool, but managers, even, even uh, if you have a tip pool, let's say you have a manager who's covering a shift at the bar, serving drinks and getting, getting direct tips, um, that's, not, that's not a problem and is not illegal. It's the minute that they dip into a tip pool or get proceeds from a tip pool that uh, you can get yourselves in trouble. Um, with tip pooling, we've already talked about sort of what the standard model is. And most tip pools, and there are many variations on this, you have some employees who are tipping out, usually your servers, they're the ones that sue the most uh, because they always think they're underpaid even though 
more often than not, they are the highest paid among, among your staff. Um, and so they're the ones that are tipping out. There may be others, you, your bartenders may be tipping out, others who are receiving direct tips may be tipping out. And then there's a pool of funds that employees share in uh, based on percentages that you all set. And, um, and uh, that's, that's sort of the classic model. We are seeing you know, some uh, hybrids or combination approaches. So where you have a, a, a tip pool, but at the same time you're um, charging a service charge. I've been seeing this a lot with um, you know, differentiating between in restaurant service versus your online orders or your, um, or, or your uh, uh, drive up pickup uh, curbside uh, approach where uh, the folks that are preparing uh, the curbside delivery stuff are, are um, you know, working in the back of the house. And so they're getting some uh, percentage of the service fee or the service charge, whereas folks that are uh, still attending to the uh, in-restaurant uh, dining experience are uh, participating in a tip pool. And what I just described is perfectly legitimate under the law. And then, of course, um, we put 20% service fee, but that doesn't mean if you have a service fee, you got to do it at 20% or that we're even recommending uh, 20%. It's just an example of some things that we've seen. And, uh, and the difference between a service fee, as most of you on the call know, is those are not, a service fee is not a tip. Um, it is defined differently under the law. It's defined differently by the Internal Revenue Service. It's treated as uh, uh, regular income or revenue to the restaurant. And as a result, you get to decide what you wanna do with it, including um, retaining a portion of it uh, or sharing it uh, with uh, um, managers or supervisors. Service fees, because they are not tips, are not governed by the tip pooling rules uh, that I talked about. And then perhaps uh, as you all start to ask questions, we can talk about other variations that uh, you all are saying. So just let me uh, humor me for a minute. I just wanna cover some other things because I really wanna make sure that you all uh, are protected against these hacks. Um, I'm sorry, these plaintiff's lawyers uh, who are representing your employees uh, against you. Um, it just drives me nuts um, because um, they are, you know, sort of lining their pockets on your backs, but um, uh, the law allows them to do it. And, uh, and if you've got it wrong, you've committed a violation. And so you're going to be held accountable for it. But some things I wanted to point out uh, out of comps order 36, me, the meal period rules, largely the same. Uh, you get a half hour duty free for every five hours worked. Duty free means duty free. If they only get 29 minutes and then you make them clock in, you own you own for the full half hour. So it's a full 30 minutes duty free. Um, so when they are clocked out, uh, nobody should be bugging them. They should be eating, um, you know, getting on their phones, Instagramming, do, doing whatever they want to do on their own time. You know, obviously since as long as it's legal, um, it's rest periods that that really have me a little uh, a little worked up because. Uh, for those of you that have attended the town halls that uh, CRA has been putting on, you've heard me say this already. Um, all of the major law firms, uh, plaintiffs law firms that handle wage and hour cases are out there trolling for these rest period cases where now under the comps order, this is true since, since um, March 16th of this year, if an employee has worked for you for four hours, at least four hours to trigger their 10 minutes, um, and by the way, under the comps order, there's a schedule for what people get, depending on how many hours work. I think for four to six hours, you get 10 minutes, six hours to eight hours, you get 20 minutes, uh, and it goes uh, on from there. If employees don't take their rest period, or you don't have some record of them taking their rest period, uh, if you don't add the 10 minutes that they missed, or the 20 minutes that they were entitled to two breaks but didn't take them, if you don't add that onto their time card, um, um, uh, you're going to get sued uh, for those small amounts of time. And what's going to happen is you may be sued for small amounts of time with your own employees, but you're going to be sued for huge attorney fee awards, um, which our uh, federal and state court judges routinely grant. Um, and as I mentioned before, there's been a huge uptick in litigation. So make sure that you're prepared for that. 
and that you are tracking uh, rest periods. Now, ordinarily, we didn't have employees clocking out uh, for rest periods, but you've got to figure out some way through your POS system or otherwise, even if you have to do it the old antique way and, and uh, track it manually, uh, have employees sign off on that. And then uh, if you can do it uh, in your HRIS system, your payroll system, your um, POS system, uh, or even do it manually, have employees sign an acknowledgement that says that they are acknowledging that they have uh, accurately recorded and reported all hours worked and have taken all rest and meal periods to which they are entitled for that pay cycle. Um, which if you do it manually is going to require you to keep, um, keep those uh, for at least three years to track that employees acknowledge that they've received everything they're entitled to. Uh, no more uniform deposits um, like you had before. You have to provide uh, uniforms if they're logoed. If it's you know, regular clothing that somebody would have in their closet, then the old FLSA rules apply. And, uh, and you don't have to pay for that. But if you require a uniform, you gotta pay for it. Um, uh, you have to have the comps order in your handbook. It also should be posted, including in Spanish uh, or other languages. If you have a population of employees that speak other languages, you can get those postings directly from the Department of Labor on their website. I know they have the Spanish one up, um, but I'm not sure about other languages. Uh, do not deduct from wages unless you have a wage deduction acknowledgement that comports with the Colorado Wage Claim Act. Uh, the Wage Claim Act allows you to deduct for cash shortages or suspected theft, but there are very specific rules that apply there. So be very, very careful about uh, deducting. Make sure that you're paying employees all earned but unpaid wages at termination. Um, that means that if, if you fire somebody, you should cut them a check right away if you can. If not, uh, and you do your own payroll, you have six hours from the start of the next workday, uh, 24 hours if you have uh, ADP paychecks, Heartland, or any of the other payroll providers. If an employee quits, that's what a voluntary termination is, um, you owe them at the next payroll cycle, not immediately, next payroll cycle. And then vacation pay and PTO. Uh, right now, um, there is conflicting law in Colorado on this point. A lot of you have had or have use it or lose it policies, um, where if employees don't uh, use their vacation, uh, they either forfeit it at the end of the year or at termination, you don't pay it out. Uh, the conflict is be between the State Department of Labor and the judiciary, our, our Colorado courts. Co uh, Colorado Court of Appeals decided the Nieto case out of Grand Junction, where they said that an employer could have a use it or lose it policy which I think, by the way, is the right interpretation of the law. The law. And I would say that even if I wasn't a jaded defense lawyer. Um, and that's on appeal to the Colorado Supreme Court. We're hoping to get a decision from them here uh, yet this fall. The Department of Labor believes that you cannot have use it or lose it policies, which is a sea change from what they were saying uh, just about a year ago. Uh, so those issues are in, uh, in, at, at odds with each other. Um, what I would do if I were in your shoes is I would pay out earned but unpaid vacation at termination until you hear either from CRA or from uh, Fisher Phillips or uh, Employers Council that uh, the state of the law uh, has been resolved. So that was a very fast and furious overview of what's going on on uh, not only the tipping front, but the uh, wage and hour front. And uh, I'm going to hand things over now. So Eileen Riley, who's gonna chat with you uh, uh, briefly and then we'll take some Q&A. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, wonderful, thank you. Um, hi everybody, um, hope everyone's enjoying the day. I know a lot of us are going through some interesting times reducing capacity again, so. Um, keep fighting. Um, I'm here to talk about um, my two restaurants, Beast and Bottle and Coperta, and what we, what changes we made to our um, our tip, our tip pulling situation or service charge. Um, so for us, as many, when Denver minimum wage um, was going to increase at the beginning of January, um, myself and my business partners were really 
looking into what would be next. Um, we knew that this increase specifically for tipped employees was going to further the disparity between front and back of the house employees. Um, and for years, we've all seen that front of the house employee wages have been increasing, but the back of the house um, hadn't necessarily been. So we really wanted to look at things um, and what we could do next to help this. Um, raising prices, I think is something that everyone always says, we'll just raise prices. Um, and I believe that we've all probably come to a level that raising prices can't really be our answer anymore because um, as we're raising prices, we're, we're doing it because of cost of good as well. Um, and at a certain point, nobody wants to pay $25 for a hamburger or $30 for a bowl of pasta. Um, these are things that um, at a certain point you start losing our guest interest um, and we wanna make sure that we're still approachable for guests to come with us. So we started looking at a couple, a couple different models. Um, we looked at um, a full house pool, um, meaning that we would have, as Todd talked about, bring everybody up to um, Colorado State wage, or we actually were looking at making higher um, than Denver minimum wage um, without the tip credit. And we would have more created a tip pool for the team. Um, we found through many different scenarios, we ran this, that it was a minimal increase for what our, our cooks and, um, and kitchen employees would have been making because you, we would have been bringing them down a bit on current hourly wages. Um, so they were gonna get a minimal increase, but we found that our uh, front of the house team was gonna be taking a huge uh, decrease, which didn't really make sense if we weren't really being able to help balance this disparity. So we kind of moved, so we moved away from that one. Um, we also looked at um, implementing a 22% um, service included or hospitality included um, and not allowing then for guest, um, for guest tipping. Um, at the time, beginning of this year, beginning of 2020, um, we chose not to go that route. Um, definitely something I still think we talk about. I know some other places have implemented things like that um, during now that COVID's passed, but we really felt that wasn't the best answer for us at the beginning of the year. Um, so what we moved forward with, um, actually, we didn't really get it started until February. Um, by the time we, we, we kind of placed all this together, but we put service charges on all of our checks. Um, and for one of our restaurants, it was 5%. And for one of the restaurants, it's a 4% service charge um, that gets added to the, at, at, the end of, at the end of the meal that guests see on their check. Um, it is a service charge. Um, we defined it as wage and benefits, um, or we call it the WB service charge is what our checks will read. Um, and what we're doing with, with these amounts that come in for the service charge, we automatically give exactly half of that full week towards the kitchen and it's divided by hours. And so it ups all of their hourly wages um, per week. Um, so that's how we use half of the service charge. The other part of the service charge, we are using it to, um, we used it to build PTO for all of our hourly employees. So prior to us adding this service charge, we did not have pay time off for hourly employees. Um, our salary managers had pay time off, but our hourly employees did not. So this was something we used to make it a benefit for um, all employees, um, including front and back of the house. Um, really for us, that was a way to get everyone behind this extra charge as well, because um, everyone got really excited about this. It's now a benefit for everybody um, for the team. So our PTO, um, they get um, up to 40 hours a week or five, um, or five shifts. That's the way that we built our PTO program. Um, we, we definitely, the, the numbers I should say, the four and 5%, we picked those by running um, qu quite a few different scenarios, but we wanted to make sure that the front of the house was not going to be taking a huge effect because these was th this, the money they were making was something they were used to but we were actually seeing a benefit for the back of the house, um, which, these num which these numbers four and 5% for the two different restaurants is where we got them. Um, we found that through adding this as well, our back of the house, um, it really brought the team together on wanting to drive volume, um, to be able to bring more people in because the back of the house is now being rewarded for the busier they are, the higher sales um, and the, the more that they're gonna be able to take home. So it created this common goal for our team as well. Um, 
I should clarify as well, our, kit, our front of the house team still keeps 100% of their tips. Um, they, they are their tip credit and they still keep 100% of them. Um, ways that we've kind of announced this is that it's clearly displayed on all of our menus. Um, it's on our webpage, but we, we try to make sure that the language is there. Um, we're very clear to it, we're very transparent. We found that the guest gets really excited when they tell up, when we tell them, you know, a portion of it goes directly back to the kitchen. Um, they get, we get like light, eyes light up and people get psyched on it. Um, I know from our side, we actually have not had anybody ask us to remove it. Um, I, I, I've not always heard that's the case for different restaurants, but we felt through transparency um, that we've had, had not had, we've had no problems, excuse me, um, with anyone asking us to take it off. And we were closed a few months during COVID, but especially now with COVID being here, it's still the same. Um, there's no difference to it. And we've, we've again had no issues with it. Um, a couple of the other challenges I would just bring up that we, that we've seen the most, um, we do get questions, as I said, um, from the guests, they, they want to know, um, especially just when they see it on the check. Um, maybe sometimes they didn't read the end of the menu where it is listed. Um, but again, we've gotten really great feedback from that. Um, occasionally we've seen some reports where you know guests pay it and they leave and they think back and they may we may then kind of get a response or an email that says it was more expensive um, because they weren't necessarily expecting, um, maybe they weren't expecting the service charge. Um, we, excuse me, um, the challenge we've also faced is when you're hiring um, a new employee in the kitchen and you give them their base pay and you're telling them that there's this service charge um, plan and since it can fluctuate from week to week depending on sales, it can be hard to get someone to really understand how much that could build into their take home um, on a weekly basis. And I think the other challenge that we've definitely seen for ourselves is, is always, is it enough? Are, are we doing enough to, to help with the disparity between the front of the house, which has always been our main focus. Um, so still continuing to look at that. Um, myself, my team, our managers, we, we do continue to evaluate this. Um, I know we're all gonna be seeing another, you know, another increase at the beginning of the year. So um, we felt that this has worked really well for our, for our team, for our guests, um, that overall we've been very happy with it. Um, definitely know that we're always continuing to look and hear other ideas and, and see if there's another step we would maybe take to continue to close this gap between the front and back of the house. Awesome. awesome. Well, thank you so much, um, Aileen and Todd. Sally, is this a good time for us to kick off the Q&A? That sounds perfect. All right, awesome. So it looks like this first one I'm seeing here is for Todd. And this person says, to clarify, if we pay full minimum wage in our respective cities, we can A, distribute tips how we see fit, B, not take a tip credit, and C, pay hourly or salary, otherwise to managers and supervisors, janitors, or whoever else they see fit. Yeah, so uh, just to be clear, uh, which is what this person's asking for, um, if you pay uh, full minimum wage, um, you, you can, sorry about that, you can distribute tips as you see fit. I'm gonna close my study door real quick. So you guys don't have to listen to my crazy dog. Um, so you can distribute tips as you see fit so long as you're not distributing to owners, managers, and supervisors, okay? Um, if, you, if you're paying that full minimum wage, whether, and keep in mind, it's always the higher of the local, state, or federal, and right now it's either gonna be local or state. Um, uh, if you pay that, then you get to share with, you know, for example, back of the house, uh, which is what I mentioned before. Uh, as well as you would be able to share with, you know, expo, food runners, expediters, and not run into the problem that I identified a little while ago. Um, you're right, you would not be taking the tip credit because you'd be paying the full minimum wage, not the tipped employee minimum wage. That's that threshold issue that I talked about at the outset. You have to make a decision on it. You're going to be a full minimum wage employer or you're going to be a tip credit, uh, uh, or tipped employee minimum wage employer. And then the last part of this is pay hourly and salary otherwise to managers, supervisors, janitors, or whoever we see fit to. Yes, your only obligation is to make sure that everybody's making minimum wage, whatever 
that is uh, for your establishment. Um, uh, you know, if you're in Denver, that higher minimum wage, otherwise it's gonna be the state minimum wage. And uh, as uh, Eileen uh, mentioned a minute ago, that's going up on January 1st, so pay attention to that. Awesome, and this next question is for you again, Todd. And this person says, if you only have an owner working with a salary to general manager, because all other staff has been left, or those are the only staff left over after COVID-19, can they share tips among themselves that they're working together? Yeah, I, I, I think those are more along the lines of direct tips. That's what I was talking about before, that, that uh, you can keep uh, direct tips, plus you're not operating a tip loop. Um, and so, um, uh, and plus, I mean, you know, it's uh, this sort of classic situation where you don't have the types of employees right now that are going to complain about these issues, which are servers uh, for the most part, you know, sprinkling in bartenders from time to time. So that's perfectly acceptable. And Todd, you did just sort of refer or reference this, but I did want to clarify for this individual's question. They said, when you're referring to the full minimum wage, opening the door for a tip pool of back of house employees, are you, are you referring to the federal minimum wage, the state minimum wage, or the local minimum wage? Whichever's higher. You always got to pay whichever is higher. That's uh, the way that that uh, federal and state law is uh, is structured. They will always defer to if local minimum wage is the highest, you got to pay that. All right. Sorry, Todd. These are coming in one after another for you. Yeah. Um, I think, and I think it's all Todd <laughs> questions and then and then questions for Eileen at the end. Yes, let me let me launch this one off you, Todd, and then I'll thank some for you, Aileen. Okay. This person says, so if we are paying full minimum wage, can we or can we not allow supervisors getting paid the minimum wage to receive an income from the tip? Um, they cannot. Owners, managers, and supervisors can never share in a tip pool. Period. So you got to make sure that if you're doing that, we unwind it and get those get those supervisors out of the tip pool. It stinks. I get it, but the case law and and the and the amendment to the uh, Fair Labor Standards Act is crystal clear. Those types of uh, people uh, in those types of positions can never share in a tip. Pool. Thank you. And this one's going to go over to Aileen. And this person says, did guests decrease the tip percentage when the service charge was rolled out? We, um, we looked at that and this was part of some of the different financials we ran, um, lowering some of these percentages so we could look at what, how it would affect our front of the house employees. Um, we actually have not seen a decrease at all in their average tips. Um, and in some cases we actually did see it go up. Awesome. I have one more here for you again, Aileen. Open it. Just missed it. Where did it go? There it is. And it says, Aileen, what are you going to do with the six days of paid sick leave in PTO for 2021? Will you add them on to your PTO benefits or are you able to provide enough time through the PTO benefit you already have that will essentially absorb this new law? And they're referring to the new paid um, sick leave law that's going into effect next year. So um, currently right now, our days are not considered um, sick days. They are paid, they are vacation um, days. So we will have to adjust it going to 2021. Um, so for the end of 2020, we'll most likely end up paying everybody out what they have and adjusting the model um, as I'm sure we're all adjusting on the fly for a lot of things going to 2021. All right, I'm gonna kick it back over to Todd. And this is a very common question we receive. Todd, if supervisors work as both a server and a supervisor, can they still be part of a tip pool when they are working as a server? No, um, I mean, you can do it. I, and I can make great arguments on your behalf as to why that should be legal. But as I said before, um, there is no basis in the law for that dual job approach. And I know that a lot of uh, restaurants have fallen in love with it. Um, uh, I, I think if you, <clears throat> if you do that, you've got a huge target on your back, you're gonna get sued and it's gonna cost you a lot of money 
uh, even, even if your lawyer prevails on your behalf, it's going to cost you $180,000 to $200,000 to vindicate yourself uh, through the attorney's fees that you're going to pay to defend that. So, um, like I said, I think there are great arguments for why the dual job approach uh, should be permissible. Uh, but I will tell you that I specifically asked our State Department of Labor to comment on that and validate that approach, and they declined to do it. And, and what that means is that the plaintiff's bar is going to see that as a sign that the State Department of Labor, at least, believes you can't have dual, the dual job approach. So, um, you know, but you do it at your own peril, and, and I would uh, highly recommend against it. All right, Aileen, I'm taking it back over your way. Typically, how much of an increase did the 5% give your back of house employees? So it definitely fluctuates and definitely fluctuates with sales um, specifically, um, and especially because we were closed from March um, through really July. Um, we, for the most part though, I'd say we're sitting in the dollar 80 is pretty much always, and we've seen it go as high as three to $4. We've had a few weeks where it's less than like that one dollar range, so it definitely spans. But we kind of try to discuss it in like a dollar eighty to a dollar to two dollars is what we would like it to be. All right, Todd, this one's coming your way. This person says, "May I pool online orders slash takeout tips among my back of house staff and let the front of house use a traditional model, essentially keeping their own tips?" Yeah, so. Um, I feel pretty comfortable that you can do that if you're paying the back of the house folks um, uh, full minimum wage um, and then allow, allowing them to share in sort of a separate, a separate pool. While at the same time, you may be taking the tipped employee uh, minimum wage, taking the tip credit uh, for your front of the house, but they're sharing in their own tip pool. So there's no, as long as you aren't cross contaminating between those two pools, Think you're fine, uh, but you got to make sure that one doesn't bleed into the other. And kind of going back to an earlier question, Todd, can you please give a definition of supervisor? Um, yeah, if you all had two hours, um, yes, I would be able to. Um, generally speaking, a supervisor is anybody who has power to hire or fire or meaningful input into that process, which is a gross generalization. Um, there's all the stuff in between, scheduling, disciplining, evaluating, um, helping set pay. Uh, I already said scheduling or setting hours, cutting. Deciding to cut is a supervisory or managerial function. Um, but most importantly, I will tell you that if you call somebody a manager or supervisor, I'm going to have a heck of a time unwinding that for you. Um, and, and what I found in the industry, and we've been talking a lot about this this year, frankly, for probably the last three or four years, is our industry loves slapping the title manager or supervisor on somebody, floor manager, uh, shift supervisor. Um, and, and, and those labels serve no purpose other than to make a, a, an employee who needs the ego boost apparently feel better about themselves. But what it does is it creates tremendous liability for you. So if, if you have somebody who's locking up at the end of the night because your managers or you can't be there to do it, don't call them a manager. Don't call them a supervisor. Call them a closer. You know, uh, somebody, I, I, uh, a client uh, called, called them a key holder. I'm okay with that. But when you use labels like manager, supervisor, even lead, um, uh, that, that can get you into trouble. When all you're really talking about is, you know, you want to call somebody a lead server um, or a lead bartender. If it's just they're, they're the most tenured among your servers or bar bartenders, call them a senior lead, uh, server or a senior bartender. Don't call them uh, by a word that suggests that they have supervisory responsibility. Um, going back to the actual question that was asked before I sort of launched into my diatribe, um, you know, it, uh, whether somebody is a supervisor is something that we fight over in litigation like you would not believe. 
Um, and, and if you are allowing them to perform supervisory related tasks, um, you're gonna get a lawsuit uh, if, if a plaintiff's lawyer finds out or you, or you have a disgruntled employee. So just be really careful um, about, about what you do. There's actually, um, if, if you uh, wanna see it, I can send you a, uh, if you'll email me, I'll send you a, a list of factors that go into whether somebody's a supervisor or manager under the Fair Labor Standards Act. And, and our State Department of Labor relies on that. Uh, and I'll tell you, I rely on it when I'm litigating the issue of whether somebody's a supervisor or a manager. All right, we have about a dozen questions here left in the queue. I wanna encourage everyone, if you have a question, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your window to send some other ones in. Todd, is the service charge model legal when dealing with several locations collecting for a commissary? Several locations collecting for a commissary? I, I'm not sure I know what that means. Molly or so Ian, we'll, do, you, do you have any sense for what that question might be about? I would imagine based on this individual, their location, they have a couple different locations around the Denver metro area. And I think that what they're asking is, can they add a service charge to each of those locations, take the revenues from those service charge and put it together in a larger pool? Um, yeah, because it's, well, well, here's the thing. So you can use it to, to share with whoever you want, because remember what I said, service charges are a different animal. You're just going to have to account for it properly. Um, and I'm no accountant, um, so make sure you talk to your CPA about making sure that you are booking that revenue in a proper way. But in terms of sharing it, I, I think it's, it's your money if it's a service charge. All right, we have entered into labor law land. So Todd, I apologize. These are gonna come one after another for you. Okay. Um, are we required to give our staff a 30 minute meal break? Um, that's a great question. Uh, before I started seeing this uptick in lawsuits, I would have said no. Um, you know, keep in mind that we have that part of the comps order that has not changed. that says that if it's not practical for somebody to take their 30 minutes, they're entitled to consume an on-duty meal. Um, so a lot of you have that issue uh, that you have to deal with. Uh, and some employees want to work through their breaks. Um, we're becoming a lot more like California where you have to have meal, meal period waivers and it may not be a bad idea to have that here. Um, as Colorado lawyers, we haven't had to do many of those. I've only done them in other jurisdictions. Uh, but that might be the, the wave of the future, uh, given that uh, the plaintiff's bar, plaintiff's lawyers are starting to argue that if you don't take the, the break, you, you know, you're overworking employees and, and, uh, and that somehow that's its own violation. Um, my reaction to that is that's why God created overtime. Uh, but, you know, call me silly. Um, so, you know, just if you're going to do that, if people are going to work through it, make sure you're, you're uh, covering the on-duty meal. And you might want to get an acknowledgement that the employee is doing it at their choice. This person says, we have a tip pool and we have a line cook that is on salary who is participating in that pool. Is that allowed? Um, only if you're paying everybody full minimum wage. If you're paying full minimum wage, then uh, uh, like I said before, the back of the house uh, staff can share and it doesn't matter how they're paid necessarily. Um, it, it's more important, uh, you know, who's tipping out and how they're paid. And they have to be paid full minimum wage. Is a server tip out considered a tip pooling? Yes. Because what, what are they tipping out to? A pool of funds, which then can be used to increase the pay of other employees. So yeah, that's, that's that classic model that I was talking about a little while ago. So. You know, once you have server, servers tipping out, by the way, what we call tipping out, um, servers refer to as uh, everything from they're making me share my money to they're stealing my money. Um, so you got to think about, you know, that, that, that actual act of tipping out is what creates the exposure here, right? That's the, that's the source of the liability that I've been talking about. So make sure that uh, 
that, um, that, that you recognize one, that you have a, a tip pool and two, that that tip pool is being run according to the rules that I've laid out for you. What if you have instituted a voluntary tip out sign off in the new hire paperwork that grants permission for servers to tip out back of house employees? Each new server has the option of signing off on a voluntary tip out to the back of house. Um, so there's a good concept here that, that this person is raising, which is um, servers, bartenders, others who receive direct tips can always decide on their own uh, to tip out uh, other employees, uh, even employees who don't customarily and regularly receive tips. I would make sure that um, that doesn't extend to your uh, uh, owners, managers, or supervisors, uh, of course. I'm sorry, I have to throw something at my dog because he's trying to get into my mind. Um, okay. Um, so the, here's the thing. If it's a, a voluntary tip sharing arrangement that you created, um, I don't think it's voluntary. And the reason I don't think it's voluntary is because the minute a Department of Labor investigator comes to your restaurant, or even worse, a plaintiff's lawyer, um, the employee is going to say, well, I didn't think it was voluntary. I felt like I had to do it. And if I didn't do it, my, my manager, my, my owner, uh, my general manager would have known that. And, uh, and so I felt coerced uh, uh, into participating or I was under duress in participating. So what I say, what I say to, to, to folks that want to approach that is really um, you, you can tell your employees that, uh, that, that uh, may want to tip out back of the house, for example, that they can do it, but it's up to them, one, whether they do it, and two, how much. And that's about as much as you want to do to touch it. Um, I, even feel, I even feel a little cheeky creating written acknowledgments on this front um, that employees sign off on because they always have the ability to say, I felt compelled or I, I was coerced into signing it. Um, so if they're going to do it, you let them do it. Um, you don't uh, penalize or retaliate against somebody who decides that they don't want to tip out. So, um, you know, I think that's the, I, I think that's, that, that's about all I want to say on that. I think it's a really dangerous area um, for, for uh, employers, restaurant employers. So how can we eliminate the maybe status of some positions regarding tip pooling for the industry's sake? How is it that we can have expos live in sort of a no man's land? Um, yeah, uh, you, th this is an issue for your uh, local Congress person. Uh, because what we need is a, a pretty significant overhaul of the Fair Labor Standards Act and things like Comps Order Number 36. So you should be working at federal levels, state levels, local levels um, to, to and, and CRA is doing this on your behalf. I mean, I've been to a number of legislative sessions with Nick Hoover and others pushing legislators and the governor, governors, it's not just this governor, to do the right thing here. Um, and, and so, you know, the, the expediters live in this no, man, uh, no man's land, as it was put, um, because it's, it, it's one of those gray areas in the law that employees and uh, their lawyers or the Department of Labor can take advantage of. Um, and, and, and the other thing that I will tell you is some of this is on you, um, restaurants. I mean, I, I love you and I want to do the best I can to protect you. That's why I'm I regularly talk to you about these issues, but some of this is on you and you got to do things to help yourselves. For example, when I say, if you're going to have expo expediters or food runners uh, participate in a tip pool, make sure that they have regular guest interaction. That means I want you to create evidence that they are in front of your customers, your patrons, minute by minute, quarter hour by quarter hour, and that you can demonstrate that in some way. Either because as part of their job description, they're delivering the, you know, the, they're, they're setting up water, providing menus, delivering the first drink, if they can do that legally, 
all of the things that a server helper, I mean, that means something, right? Somebody is, who's helping a server serve the guest. So if you're gonna use Food Runners, Expo, Expediters, please make sure that you build into their job descriptions that they have that regular interaction. And by the way, this ain't new. I've been saying it for a long time and, and, uh, and it's the, these, these cases are starting to hit. So um, uh, help, your, help yourselves in this area because um, it'll go a long way in fending off the Department of Labor or even worse a lawsuit. This person says, we are collecting tips from our to-go orders. These tips are not assigned to any of the front of house employees. Is there a way to use these tips to tip out the back of house employees without having to raise all of our front of house employees to regular minimum wage? Yeah, we, we already talked about that. That's, the, that's just a variation on that question before about somebody having two pools of funds. And as long as you keep them separate, I think you're going to be just fine. Um, and it doesn't jeopardize the tip credit because the servers, they're responsible for the front of the house. They're not touching this, uh, you know, to go or online order piece of the business. And, and all you have to do is make sure that what you're paying them plus their tips results in the higher of the federal, state, or local minimum wage. And I've seen a couple of requests come through for maybe language for a law that specifically allows that. Do you have something that people could reach out to email you for? Language for a law or language for a acknowledgement? A, a language that essentially allows that scenario where takeout or delivery tips are going to back of house employees. Um, yeah, I don't know if I've drafted anything yet because so many of you are doing it where you're just, you know, with this sort of, with the advent of, of you know, online uh, ordering and all of that stuff, um, you know, you're already paying back of the house full minimum wage, so that's just gravy on top. Um, you know, that might be something for uh, for CRI, CRA and I uh, to work on creating. Um, it'd be really easy to do, right? And 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 you know, because it doesn't involve servers, it wouldn't be necessarily you know part of what you provide to them. It'd be what you provide to the back of the house. Awesome. So stay tuned are, on that are, one, everyone, way, these please. Are awesome questions. And, and think about what good you're doing to those who are participating in the call because you know everybody's got these questions on their mind. So thanks for being brave about asking these questions. And, and I know I can be kind of blunt and a pain in the neck, but really I, I just want to protect you. Um, I, I don't want you having to deal with plaintiff's lawyers. They're chumps and, and they drive me nuts. Not all. Not all plaintiff's lawyers are chumps. I should be very careful to not overgeneralize. But the ones that are that are bringing these wage and hour cases, you know, to hear them say, um, you know, that they're protecting the rights of servers, blah blah blah, and that's all fine and well uh, if servers needed their rights protected. But given what you know, I know servers are making in many of your restaurants, and what your back of the house is making, uh, something's got to give. Um, so anyway, I just. Keep them coming. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to sit on this call until we get them all answered. So this person says, say we get back to quote unquote normal in the next five years. Can we change back to the model of tipped and hour, hourly employees and leave the tip pool? Can we, they just start taking the tip credit again? Yes, you can shift back and forth. You just have to do it with notice to your employees. And you do that by virtue of a, by virtue of a tip memo. And again, I'm willing to share um, uh, my template. Um, Molly, I, I may have even provided to, to that to CRA before on one of our calls. So, you know, yes, even without did. people asking it, I, I'm perfectly happy if, if you ship that off uh, to the attendees and just know that it has to be tailored to your particular business. I, I think the model I have is, is uh, from a, a sushi restaurant type of arrangement. So you'll, some, you'll see some references in there to sushi chefs and things like that that it may not fit your particular enterprise. So uh, make sure that you're modifying it to fit your particular needs. All right, I do wanna be respectful of everyone's time. Todd mentioned that he was gonna stay on so we can get these uh, questions answered, but Aileen, I don't see any other ones coming from you or for you specifically. So thank you so much for your time. If you need to drop off, don't feel obligated to stay on while we go through these other ones. Thank you all. 
So Todd, this one's going over to you. Um, can servers who are shift leaders have a separate pool from online or takeout orders? Um, I, I hate the word sh shift leaders for reasons I've already described. Um, I hope Eileen's stay, staying on because she's got great knowledge. Um, but that aside, um, shift leaders sharing in a tip pool. I mean, that depends on a whole slew of things, including what the heck you mean by shift leaders. Um, you know, are, are they shift leaders because they lead the shift, they schedule, they tell people what tables they get, what sections or zones they get. Um, they get to decide whether somebody gets cut at the end of the day, as opposed to somebody else. Because if, if the answer to those questions in whole or in part is yes, you have supervisors sharing in the tip pool. And, and as I've already mentioned, that gives me enormous heartburn um, because I know you're going to get sued. So uh, I, I'd figure out some other way to compensate uh, your shift leaders if they fit that mold that I just described. If they're not really shift leaders, call them something else. If it's just your senior servers, um, let them, you know, let them, uh, that, you know, they can participate so long as they're not operating as supervisors. By the way, don't get too fixated on titles, even though I keep talking about no managers, no supervisors, no uh, leads. Um, there's, there's another word that was on the tip of my tongue that you all like to use a lot that concerns me a, a bit, but because it connotes supervision or management. Um, but you got to think about titles, but you also got to think about what these people are doing. I mean, you can call somebody, like I've been suggesting, a senior server, but if they're truly a supervisor or a manager, they shouldn't be sharing in the tip. Pool. So, you know, it's uh, this whole issue of, of, of supervisory and managerial status is a tremendous source of litigation in Colorado and everywhere else. You got to be really clean on who's a manager and who isn't. And you can't look at ways, you can't look to dipping into the tip pool to reward your managers and supervisors, no matter how good they are and how deserving they are. You just can't have them participate in the tip pool. So here's another one. Can you use a service fee in addition to allowing tips or a tip pool? Yes, that's the hybrid approach that we were talking about a little while ago. So uh, again, you just wanna be really clear about um, you know, one versus the other, what you're doing with the proceeds of a service charge versus what you're doing with the uh, proceeds in a tip pool. If a bartender takes the to-go order, can we exclude them from the tip pool on takeout orders? If a bartender takes a to-go to, to -go order, can you exclude them? Um, yeah, I mean, I, well, the, the starting point in answering this question is you get to decide what that tip pool looks like within the legal parameters that I've described and who gets to share in it and, and who doesn't. And so I, I think that that's okay. Um, you know, I'd probably need to know a little more about that and we could talk about it offline, but I think generally speaking, uh, it's okay to do that. You have a really pissed off bartender and that's 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 not a legal issue that's an employee relations issue um and perhaps you have some other way to manage that but um i, I think as a as a legal uh, approach it, it it's fine all right so earlier todd you mentioned that the amount of tip credit claimed needs to be notified to the employee can you elaborate on that yeah, so the tip credits defined right now by uh, comps order 36, for those of you that are subject to the state law, I think it's similarly defined in the, the ordinance that uh, the city of Denver issued for their higher minimum wage. You need to notify employees what that amount is. Um, and uh, I'm not smart enough to do that off the top of my head, but I know that in the comps order, it gives you that specific amount. Uh, and I believe the city's ordinance does that as well. It's always the, and, it, it always tracks it, you know, the full minimum wage lasts 302, I think. I think yeah. that's right. I think it's 302. Am I right? You're, you're nodding. So 
Yes. If three great minds are shaking their heads, yes, it must be right. Um, so yeah, uh, but that that amount changes uh, from time to time. So you know you need to to let employees know what that is. Your posters will take care of that. If you're posting the comps order every January one, you're putting up the new comps order. For those of you that are covered by state law, you're going to be protected. Um, for those of you that are subject to the Denver ordinance, you might want to just post the Denver ordinance with that with that. Uh, like uh, that amount in it. And folks, I'm seeing a couple of questions come here through to Todd, and they're a little bit out of the scope of our wage model and tip pooling that's conversation. Okay. So I will send those over to him. No, um, that's just okay. to I'll open answer. a broader yeah. conversation. Yeah. <laughs> oh, can, okay, I, let's go. I can I can answer them. So so there's one. Um, are you required? Yeah, I can see one of them. Are you required to pay employees for COVID testing and hours worked? Um, depends on uh, uh, why they're seeking the COVID test. Um, I mean, if they are experiencing symptoms and they are seeking a medical diagnosis, uh, diagnosis um, and you are a FAFICRA covered employer, which means that you are under 500 employees and most of you on this call are, um, that person is probably entitled to paid sick leave. Um, and so uh, you would have to pay them. If they're just getting a COVID test, like I did the other day before I went on a little trip to Moab, um, and I was an hourly employee, that's something that I'm doing of my own volition. You don't have to pay for that. Depends on what, what the reasoning is for, for seeking that out. Should we address Will the hourly of PTO laws? Um, yes, go ahead, please do. Okay, all right. So the question was, what did you do with it? Um, well, oh, it, I'm sorry, I just dismissed it. Did you move into well, answer? It, our, yeah. yeah, it said it said will yeah. hourly employees yada 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 under the new PTO laws. Did you, did you find that? Yes. Are they? Um, apologies, Todd. I thought that you had already seen that one. Yeah. No. I, I mean, I was looking at it because I, I knew that it was outside the scope, but I thought we could knock it out pretty quickly and uh, not have to Here send that person. An invoice. Uh, Will hourly tipped employees be entitled to PTO under new laws starting in 2021? Yes. Yeah. So you've got the new paid sick leave law that is already on the books. Um, it has two parts. It's applying for FICRA to larger employers, 500 or more, that you have to comply with through the end of this year. And then January 1 of 2021, you have the Healthy Families and Workplaces Act which is paid sick leave. It's garden variety paid sick leave for employees. They accrue one hour for every 30 hours worked up to the cap of 48 annually, unless we have a public health emergency or the continuation of a public health emergency, in which case they may be entitled to 80 hours. Uh, and the difference under the state law, as opposed to FIFICRA that covers most of you, and we've been talking about that since COVID hit, right? We've, we've, we've had seminars just on that issue is that you get a tax credit right now for uh, employees who take for FIC relief. And it's dollar for dollar credit in your next payroll cycle. So if you provide paid sick leave of $1,000 uh, today uh, in your next payroll cycle, if you are under 500 employees and covered by for FICRA, you get $1,000 worth of credit uh, against your payroll taxes in the next cycle. Uh, that does not exist under the new law, just so you all know that. Um, and uh, you know, if we need to, we can uh, provide a separate seminar on uh, on all of that down the road. But um, yeah, uh, our employees are uh, and those who get tipped are going to be entitled to it. And there's a particular formula for that. Uh, if you go online to the Colorado Department of Labor and Employment's website and you pull up their info sheet 6B, that will tell you how you calculate the paid sick leave entitlement in 2021. All right, I had a couple of questions come through specifically asking if you pay the full minimum wage, can the full house participate in a tip pool? Can you clarify that once more for us, Todd, please? Can the, yeah, so everybody can participate except owners, managers, and supervisors. If you pay the full minimum wage. So this one says, I have a server that also is scheduled several supervisor shifts per week. She does not serve on her supervisor shifts. On her supervisor shifts, she would not be part of a tip pool. On her serving shift, she could not be part of the tip pool and therefore could take her own direct tip. 
Is this correct? Yeah, the, the direct tips part uh, threw me a little bit. Um, if it's just the dual job thing that I've already talked about, um, you are flirting with danger um, because uh, it doesn't matter. Um, all your employees are ever going to remember is that a manager shared uh, in tips, uh, even though they were only sharing in the tips, uh, direct or otherwise, when they were a server. Um, and, and like I, I, I've said now, and, the, uh, and I know I'm starting to sound like a, a broken record, but there's no basis in federal, state, or local wage and hour law to allow for that dual job approach. So you do it at your peril. Um, the, the, can you reread the direct tips part again, Molly? Because I want to make sure I captured that. She says during the serving shift, she would not be part of the tip pool and therefore would take her own tips. Is that allowed? Yeah, if there's, I guess if where this person is heading is that that person, regardless of what they're doing, is not sharing in a tip pool then you're not running afoul of the things that I talked about. Um, it's the minute that somebody who's not entitled to share in a tip pool does so that creates the liability and exposure that we're talking about on this call today. So if there's a clear line of demarcation between those things, then you, you're probably okay. Um, I say probably because um, again, there's it doesn't cost a, an employee a single cent to sue you. Uh, plaintiff's lawyers take cases on contingent fee, just like uh, personal injury lawyers. And, and so if they, if they see anything that they think is fishy, they can essentially sue you with impunity because they get their attorney's fees, you don't get yours. Even if you win, um, you don't get your attorney's fees paid. So, you know, think about that. Think about whether it's going to create uh, the sorts of issues that would cause an employee to go to a plaintiff's lawyer. Are we really only down to two? We are down to two. We are getting through them. Thank you for your time. Oh, and we just had more and more pop-ups. We are down to three. Um, so this is a follow-up to an earlier question. And it says, what if you have a voluntary tip-out sign-off in the new hire paperwork that grants permissions for servers to tip out back of house? It's the same issue. Um, it's a document that you've created. Your employees, I mean, most are going to be honest and, and aren't going to do this, but it's just the one or two that are going to say, you know, as part of everything else that I had to sign and think about what you're doing. You're having them in the new hire, you're having them fill out a W-9 required by law. Um, I'm sorry, a W-2, a W-4, an I-9, both of which are required by law, a handbook to, uh, acknowledgement, which you require because you expect employees to abide by them. Uh, and then you're going to have them sign a voluntary tip out sheet. Um, all they're going to remember is you gave them a bunch of documents that they felt like they had to sign. Um, if you have that going, you're much better off if yet, you know, the subject comes up, usually initiated by employees. You know, what if we want to do that? We want to help out the back of the house. You're much better off taking an existing program that your employees have started. I say program, that makes it sound much more formal. An existing approach that your, um, that, that your employees, your servers already have and memorializing that. Um, that's the way to approach an acknowledgement um, because it acknowledges something that already is voluntary and not regulated by you. The minute you're creating the documents, you're regulating it. And I think that that's a, I think that's a big mistake. I get why you're doing it. Um, um, and, and, and there may be some ways to finesse it uh, so that it, it uh, gives me less heartburn, but um, uh, chances are pretty good you're going to have employees say they felt compelled to sign it. Awesome. And Todd and Eileen, thank you so much for generously spending your time with us past yeah. our um, specifically allotted time. Unfortunately, I have to hop off soon. So I'm going to cap these um, right here at our final four remaining questions. And anyone else, if you have questions that are not seen here, I can send them over to Todd and Eileen um, offline. So this person says, if a server regularly closes and tips out to the buffer, um, is this a can of worms? I was just trying to find it. If a server regularly closes, it tips out to the buzzer. Um, no, not if that person's doing it of their own volition. 
The difference there is, you know, it's not memorialized by something you required as, as part of the new hire orientation process. So we're probably just fine there. That's that's what I'm talking about is a server deciding on their own to help somebody out because they did a good job. Um, and I'm totally, I'm totally comfortable with that. And the law recognizes the ability of servers to decide on their own uh, to tip out. But almost every time I've had an audit or an investigation by the Department of Labor and a voluntary tip sharing program has been an issue, uh, there, th there has been at least one, and it's usually multiple employees who say, we felt coerced to participate. Can I, Can a just, restaurant may, let me just knock out these other ones. Yep, let's knock them out. Okay, yeah, because I got I got a call in 15 minutes. So, um, so can I speak? Uh, and it, this is for either one of us, Eileen, you or me. Can you speak on or clarify adding back a house employees to the tip pool? Example, we pay them all over the minimum wage in varying degrees. Can we drop their wage to, to the minimum and use the 2% collected from the services and add the back of the house to the tip pool? Or do the, do the servers and all other front of house employees need to be raised from 8.98 to 12 bucks? Um, if you share with the back of the house, you darn well better be paying full minimum wage. So the answer is yes, you gotta raise them. Um, uh, you say we pay them all over the minimum wage in varying degrees, but you just suggested that you're not paying um, servers in front of the house employees the full minimum wage because you mentioned 898. So that would have to be raised because that's not the full minimum wage. Uh, next person says, I've been sharing cash tips with back of the house not to exceed an additional $2 an hour from back of the house. Any amount of cash tips that exceed that amount get distributed amongst front of the house along with their credit card tips for the tip pool. Staff was made aware of this policy in writing. Is this okay or asking for trouble since it's ultimately a pool and not clearly separated? Um, depends on whether you're paying full minimum wage or not. If you're, if you're taking a tip credit, um, it's a problem. If you're paying full minimum wage, it's legit. Uh, let's see, next person. Can the restaurant be considered part of the tip pool? No, uh, that's the owner sharing in a tip pool. Um, yeah, I, I get this question all the time. How much can the house get out of tips? And the answer is nada, zilch, zip, nothing. The house can never share in a, in a tip pool, ever, period. Okie doke, we did it. We did it. Todd and Aileen, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, everyone, thank you for tuning in and listening to our experts here. This will be recorded and made available on demand um, within about 24 hours. Um, and we greatly appreciate both of you spending your afternoons with us. You're thank welcome. You. Thanks for including us. Good luck, everybody. Hang in there.